All right, hello and welcome to another episode of Steel Fur Speaks with me, Steel Fur, coming at you from my scuffed room in East London. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, uh, I am a former L5R player. Uh, well, still an L5R player, a flesh and blood player. I used to play Magic. I used to play lots of different card games, I guess, over the years. Wrestling, I played wrestling. I've got some Digimon cards right here. You know, if you're into Digimon, you can have a quick look at them. Um, you know, from the new set, they're quite shiny. You've got a bit of Omnimon, Omnimon Zort, you know, just opened those from some pre-release packs. So I generally just like card games and, you know, the current main obsession is Flesh and Blood. I'm still playing Legend of the Five Rings because I'm on the, the player council that's keeping that going. Um, and, and that's kind of where we are with all of that. Um, so the topic of discussion today, so obviously we've had quite a few road to nationals now across the world we've had the first two in the uk and i played in both um i came second in the first one by by this much and i came first in the second one which is how i've got that lovely um spring tunic right there and of course if we dig into the box of promos we can of course see the the one true beauty of the spring tunic um extended art which is gorgeous um and i'm keeping that uh even though i won't use it all the time what deck was i playing i was playing agro katsu uh which i think is a very good deck i'm gonna do a deck tech next week just because this week is hectic busy and i've got another two events this weekend and i'm helping friends practice and there's there's loads of stuff going on that means i can't do a deck tech for you guys right now um you know as well as respecting the fact that there are some other people who have given me a lot of advice about the deck that are playing that deck this weekend i don't want to give away all the secrets right before they go into the event they're going to try and qualify in so i think that's kind of fair so if we're not talking about that what are we here to talk about so we're going to talk a little bit about meta heroes what it feels like to play against them um which ones feel really threatening which ones you can kind of you know approach differently what feels consistent, what doesn't feel consistent. We're going to talk through some resources to get good deck ideas. We're going to talk in general about how fun Road to Nationals feels, um, how the Swiss system works, how the strength of schedule works, um, and generally just, you know, we're going to talk about um, being a player at an event, you know, rulings and stream drama and, and all the sorts of things that come up during the tournament season that I think would be interesting to talk about. So where to start, really? Um, let's have a brief overview of my current experience with the Road to Nationals. So obviously, um, in the first event on day one, I lost round one to a brute player, playing more controlly deck that I wasn't really ready for. Um, then I played Bravo. And I was very much tilted by the fact that I'd lost round one. And this is kind of like something to be aware of for your own road to nationals is if you lose round one, you're not out of the tournament by a long stretch. Um, you will have to win your next four games, but you know, you can do that. And you know, if you keep a calm head, you can stay in the event. Um, I wasn't, I left like 15 damage on the table in the first three turns where I could have properly played cards to get damage on the table. Or I, I actually misread spinal crush because again, I was tilting, um, and thought that I could play a Minoism to, to just get it out of my hand, and then it was only stopping the go again on attack actions, which obviously wasn't the case. Um, and, you know, that kind of thing really sort of can push you off and put you off your game, but you've kind of got to, you know, just, as I said to myself during that game, take a deep breath, come back into it, play properly, you know what the cards do. And after saying that to myself, I rallied, I won that game. And then obviously I went undefeated into the finals playing Chain, playing against Prism, I played against a Dorinthia. And then in the in the in the top eight, I played against a Dorinthia, a Prism, and a Chain. And I lost to the Chain. And I was kind of annoyed by the loss because basically I had my breaking scales on the table face up. Well, okay, let's set the scene a bit more. So I was on 36 life, and he was on 20. So I'm winning this race. He gets a double Art of War turn and brings me down to 20. I take him down to 9. He has a third Art of War, and he's on 4 Shackles. So I'm thinking, I'm sitting there now on 20. He's got a full hand. 
but he's on nine life. So I'm like, okay, cool. Let's just take all the damage. In my hand, I have Surging Whelming. I have a pitch for it. I have a head. I have what I need. And in my arsenal, I have the Whelming. So I, I've got the Magenshin. I can do everything, right? Perfect hand for Katsu. And so I'm there. Just take the damage, right? Nothing is freaking me out about this. On 20 life, let's just take the damage. Took it all. Um, to a certain point, he consuming volitioned me. I discarded the head jab. I didn't need it anyway. I had the resources and I had my full combo in my hand. Perfect. Then he command and conquers me on the last attacks. This is five attacks coming at me with a art of war boosted command and conquer for seven. That will kill me because he's managed to do the 20 damage to me in one turn. And I'm just like, okay, cool. So block out the command and conquer. Next turn, come in with the whelming, the surging strike. Fine. I get him down to th to two, and he gets me down to three. At this point, I've been blocking plenty, just keeping the... Because I need to keep my life type a lot, because the, the arcane damage um, will kill me if I let it go much lower, um, and was killing me. So I basically say, okay, let's block. I keep the Whelming Gust Wave. I Kodachi, Kodachi, Gust Wave. Um, at which point he blocks the Kodachis... Sorry, he blocks, he takes one of the Kadachis down to two, and then he blocks the Whelming for three. And I should have used Breaking Scales to deal one more point of damage to him. If I had, then he would have been on one, and I drew a full three block hand, and I blocked his entire turn out except for two arcane damage, which took me to one, but he would have died from blood debt from the husk. So the lesson from day one is always take chain to one if you can. They have husk. I didn't see it. I lost out. The second day, the lesson was don't miss your train. Um, I got delayed on the tube for about half an hour longer than I thought I would. Um, I actually didn't plan on going to the event. Um, literally a friend of mine, I was sitting there on the train. I missed the train. I missed the, the connection that I was going to need to get. I was sitting there looking at the timetables. I was like, well, I'm not going to get the train I need to get to get there on time. So I went back to the station where I had been changing trains, got on the train to go home was waiting for it to leave for about five minutes. And then during that delay, one of the people I ended up playing later in the event was like, hey, why don't you come to the event anyway and just chill out? You know, you'll miss the first round. So I go and, and, and I'm just like, okay, yeah, I've got nothing better to do today. I'm just going to go home and, you know, tidy and play computer games or whatever. So I turn around, I go to the event and I get there. I, I show up about 15 seconds late after my opponent's been given the win. The judge is like, I've literally just given it to him. So you can't play. And I'm like, okay, cool. Lose the first round. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm out of this, to be honest. I've lost the first round. My head isn't there. I'm, I'm really tired due to some other stuff that was going on where I got woken up at four in the morning by a scammer or whatever. Um, but somehow I just calm down and I rally. I play uh, Viserai. I play a Katsu Control. I play four chains in a row. Um, I played a dash. Um, and then in the final cut, I played chain, chain, dash. And my chain matchup's quite good, so I was feeling good. I'd already beaten one of the players I played in the top four, um, who was King of Swiss, and I knocked him off his undefeated record. So I was feeling good all at that point. And once I got to the finals, uh, we were kind of sitting there at the stream table, and the the, the, uh, the streamer had a really good setup with these lights that were just like pointing straight at me, and they were just keeping me awake. And I was like, I don't really matter how tired I am, I have these massive daylight lights pointing at me. It was fantastic. So... That's kind of how the day went. And I, you know, there's, there's there's a video, I'll link to it um in down below, but there's a video of my final three matches on stream because there was a bit of mm, there was a bit of sort of friction about who was gonna go on stream, with a lot of players in the top eight not actually wanting to go on stream. Um uh, so I just said sure, and my opponent was like, Okay, cool, and we're just gonna go on stream. So I went on stream for the last three matches and then for the final, obviously. So I guess that's a good point to stop and let's talk about streaming flesh and blood because that's kind of a topic a lot of stores are getting into streaming for road to nationals and it is genuinely a fantastic thing like streaming is 100 percent a fantastic thing for this game um you get better by watching good players play on stream um players get better playing on stream and being held to a higher standard where everyone is watching them um Games are exciting. People like watching them. We had 50 people watching the stream, and that's just from a small event on UK time zone, which not a lot of people would have watched live. Like, 
the engagement with the game where tournaments are streamed is 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 up here in terms of how is the meta progressing that person did this really interesting thing in, from their local meta i've never seen oh i didn't realize that hero was this strong i might need to build it or plan against it like the more we talk about and the more we see other tournaments happening the more the meta progresses streaming is absolutely fantastic and i commend the guy um i think his tabletop 24 is his youtube channel but i'll put a link to it i really commend the guy who sat there he did 10 hours of streaming um not even commentating the games as well which i would be forced to do if i was streaming for that long i'd be i'd be commentating the games but he just hooked up the microphones and let players talk and, and talk about what was going on and he did a lot of other stuff behind it as well like recording videos and, and doing lots of talking around it but you know just just massive kudos to him um, but there is a dark side to all of this, and it's kind of what I want to talk about, because mistakes in card games happen. They happen at casual level, competitive level, they happen at world championship level. Any card game tournament you go to, there, there will be mistakes. And Road to Nationals are specifically casual level events. It's very important. Absolutely vital to remember that although they lead towards a competitive level national event they are still casual level tournaments and that's just a vital piece of information that a lot of people who are trying to win are forgetting and i think it's important to remember that so if your opponent makes a mistake and you start to get mad that the judge hasn't thrown the book at them it is important to remember the level of the event you're playing in and I have seen over the past weekend occasions where a player made a mistake, right? And genuine mistake. You know they... Okay, how do you tell if someone's cheating? It's hard. But there is a genuine litmus test for how someone is cheating, which is they do something wrong, and the first thing they do is go to their opponent and say, sorry, I've done this wrong. Let's call a judge and put up their hand. Because a cheater doesn't tell you. If you don't notice, a cheater won't say anything, right? But the first thing a player does when they make a mistake, like they draw an extra card... They pay for something wrong and you've already taken the damage or they've triggered an on-hit effect that they shouldn't have. Something has happened. They say, whoa, sorry, how do we fix this? Let's get a judge over and sort it out, right? That's important. Just a first litmus test. If your opponent is telling you they've made a mistake, then they didn't cheat in that instance. Now, maybe they are using it as a smokescreen for cheating at another point, but, you know, let's not get into that. My point is, your opponent says, I've made a mistake. You're thinking the judge is going to be like, oh, I'm going to give them a game loss. I'm going to give them an intellect penalty. It's in the rules. You can give like an intellect penalty for two turns. They're going to get the damage reversed and not counted. All of these things that might happen in a super serious competitive event. But you're at a road to nationals. It's not that level. If someone draws an extra card. The competitive level punishment for that is that you as the opponent get to look at their hand and banish one of those cards face down in their banish zone that they can no longer have. But at a road to nationals, that's not what it is. You shuffle the hand. A card is chosen at random by your opponent, by a dice, whatever. That card is banished face down with neither player looking at it. You don't get an advantage. You don't get to know what card is missing. You don't get... Your opponent doesn't get to know what card is missing. You both just collectively say, okay, cool, I made a mistake. Pick one. It could be good for me. It could be bad for me. I don't know. You don't know. The information stays hidden and... You just move on. There are flaws with it, like opponent could see he has a bad hand and then accidentally draw one to try and get something shuffled in, but that's just not... It's not the point. The point is the punishment matches the level of the event you're playing in. And it's important to not get frustrated with judges or your opponent when that sort of resolution is applied and keep a calm head about the event you're actually playing in. Um, even more so, as a step on from that, is what happens if... The judge then makes a mistake in the event, right? Because, and we're talking about streams here for a reason, because when these mistakes happen, people at the event can be very quick to calm down. I'm playing, I'm, someone makes a mistake as my opponent, I'm happy with the resolution. I say, cool. The stream goes crazy, and people are yelling about how I've done something wrong or how everyone is making mistakes. And we had a post on Facebook two weeks ago where... There was a video where someone clearly blocked an attack with three cards saying it was 12 when it should have been nine. Now, if you were to look at that at a world championships level, you would say that person should know better. That looks like cheating. The judge should have done something quite strict about it. But at an RTN level, the two players have been playing for 10 hours. They're friends. They're playing casually together. 
you fix it. You fix it the best you can. They take three damage or something else happens. You know, you, you sort out a solution. You rewind if someone catches it. If no one catches it, then no one caught it and the game continues. The point is, these mistakes happen at every level. And all that really matters is that both players have a responsibility to maintain the game state. You want to try and spot any errors that repeatedly occur to the point where they are beneficial to you or to your opponent i.e. my opponent keeps opting two instead of one and it keeps being a mistake like you have to punish these in some ways to control people but what you don't need is a lot of people basically projecting perfection onto the games that they're watching from a distance and assuming that they don't themselves make similar levels of mistakes while they're watching while they're playing their own games right because everyone makes mistakes um, and there's this idea, and it's always been the case when it comes to streaming card games, of assumed perfection where I am pushing my view as a player who's not got the stress or hasn't been playing for 10 hours and trying to say that person misplayed deliberately, all these other things, when probably not the case. Probably both people are playing slightly sloppily. Your opponent isn't calling you on triggers. You're not properly announcing stuff. Because if you do watch some of the streams, for example, that I've played in, I say how many cards I've got left in my hand at the end of turn, I say how many I'm drawing. I draw that many. I accidentally made a mistake once. The judge caught it um, and said, actually, you've, you've still got one in your hand. Fixed it. Um, I say how much damage. I announce on hit effects clearly. I check for blood debt. I check, you know, at the end of every turn, has my chain player taken his blood debt? Have I marked down the lost HP? We compare the HP trackers on our on our pads because you have you should really, really write down hp loss if you're playing in a proper tournament just so you have a record that you can refer to and you basically talk about the game as much as possible it doesn't necessarily mean reminding your opponent of stuff they don't ask about right like telling your opponent your mask of momentum is going to trigger if they don't block as long as they don't ask you for it right if someone says is mask on and you go yeah one two three mask is on you don't go, and then, you know, you say, because otherwise you're you're lying about the game state. But it's not it's not up to you to, you know, necessarily provide all the information, but you shouldn't restrict any of it either. You know, your health, how many cards you've got in hand, cards in Arsenal, how much an attack is hitting for, if it has on hit effects, is all public knowledge, right? You know, for the, every time you feel like you've caught someone out by not announcing an on hit effect on a card you've played, basically is, you know, another time that, You've just slowed down the game by a bit more. You've confused, like, you know, it's fine to just play Consuming Volition and say, okay, cool, I'm playing Consuming Volition. Expect your opponent to know what it does. Um, but if your opponent asks you what it does, then obviously the quicker you tell them, the quicker the game gets going, the quicker the game continues. Um, I get this a lot playing Katsu because people are like, well, what does what does Whelming Gust Wave do? And I'm obviously never going to tell them if they don't know what the hidden pieces of the combo do because that's knowledge that they need to learn if they want to beat katsu but if they ask what a card i've played does i tell them my point is people need to get better at communicating when it comes to playing on stream making sure that less triggers happen but the community as well also needs to be less harsh with the people actually playing the game and accept that mistakes are going to be made and ultimately it doesn't matter if a single mistake is made or a few mistakes are made ultimately what matters is the overall integrity of the tournament if one or two mistakes are made in a game the likelihood is the person who play the person who is ahead in the game is still going to win if a judge accidentally makes the wrong ruling the likelihood is the tournament is still going to run with the player who would have won the tournament still winning right ultimately these things shouldn't happen all that much but when they do you know, the disruption to the entire event as a whole doesn't necessarily have to be that huge. It can, it, you know, it, it is definitely there, but it's not necessarily the end of the world. And also they just do happen. You just have to plan for it. Um, you just have to plan to keep the event going and keep the integrity of the event going. And that's not saying that you can have a judge who makes a wrong call every two games. But for example, if a judge makes one wrong call in a tournament, that's fine. That's like margin of error. That's going to happen. You just have to keep going. And then as you got the levels of competitive, obviously less wrong calls get made, more other judges get consulted. But this is kind of like expecting this much 
from an event that's at this level. And that's kind of the takeaway from this section of the video is that people watching RTN streams need to realize that the event is actually a casual level. It's down here. Most of them have one judge who has only recently passed a judge exam, which has only recently been written. Mistakes are going to be made. We're not we're not up here at nationals. We're not up here at calling where you're going to have three or four judge teams. And if something goes wrong, another judge can come and give advice. Most RTNs have one judge if they're lucky. Some don't even have you know, a full-time judge, they have a TO. So I think that's quite interesting. So what are we moving on to next? Let me let me minimize myself now as I move sort of out of the talk point. Interesting websites and resources. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is this. Now, this hasn't been updated yet. Um, at least I'm going to see. I don't think it's been updated yet, but I think this is very fascinating. Um, just as an idea of what heroes are doing what in the meta. Um, and you'll see that Bolton, you know, is this kind of a breakdown of everyone's top eight um, qualifications versus wins. You know, so Katsu has won five RTNs um, and had 31 top eight spots. Chain has had 35 and won three, which is bizarre. Um, he should have, he's probably won a lot more by now. My point is, one of the things that's quite interesting about this Road to Nationals meta is just how diverse it is. You know, we've seen Dash winning. Dorinthia. Prism has won now. Prism hasn't won for a while, which was weird in week one, but Prism has definitely won now. Uh, Bravo's been winning. Bolton's been winning. So that's over eight, nine, nine different heroes. Now, some are winning more than others, but Chain is very heavily represented because people like Chain. He's strong. And he's from the new set, which a lot of people will have started playing in Monarch. They'll have the cards for Chain. They won't have all of the Mask of Momentums and the Tectonic Plates. They won't go back and buy them because they'll have opened, you know, Husk and they'll be playing Chain. So it's important to understand that not every player is spending spending tons of money to get all the hero cards when they've opened good stuff in Monarch. And that's one of the reasons Chain is so popular. So that's an interesting site. Um, I can give the link to it. I hope he updates it for week two um, just for analytics because it's really good to hover over it. Um, so... The next site I want to talk to you about is fabdojo.wordpress.com. This is a New Zealand-based site that I know has been talked about on other websites and, and people have talked about it, but I found this very, very useful. Um, I hope they do expand to other countries and just track deck lists because a lot of what is coming up and what of people are asking for at the moment in terms of Road to Nationals is, oh, you know, what did you win with? What was your, you know, what was your takeaway? Uh, what hero should I play? What's my meta? Um, and... There's a few things I want to talk about on that front. The first thing is, if we go back to this chart, I mean, chain representation, you know, we've seen Ryanar representation, Viserai. My general theory, and people can question this if they want, is that the heroes that people are playing aren't actually the heroes that are the best, right? Because you could have a tier hero list, and I personally think it goes, um, you know, chain, katsu, dash, um, Bravo. Uh, I mean, who comes after that? Prism. Uh, what else is on our list here? Bolton's there. Yeah, Prism, Bolton, um, Dorinthia. Then probably you're getting down to like Reinar, Viserai, other people. Um, you know, Kano has made a top eight, which is ridiculous because uh, he can melt some people. But it's very, very rare. My point is you can have a tier list, but that tier list doesn't really that effective in flesh and blood because a lot of the pairings are rock paper scissors you know um you know katsu has got a very good pairing against chain chain has got a very good pairing against um prism prism has got a very good pairing against dorinthia you know and when you go around like that it really is a call as to what people are playing in your local area and a lot of the people i speak to assume that that is this list of best decks like Oh, well, Dash is amazing. Everyone's going to be playing Dash. Matt Rogers, you know, shout outs to him. People watch him like a hawk. He won a, he won a road to national with Dash last weekend. So everyone's going to be playing Dash. And I have to keep reminding people to stop for a second. The majority of people do not have the cards to change heroes at a moment's notice. The majority of people will not change heroes at a moment's notice because they're playing their favorite hero. And the majority of people do not feel confident or haven't had the practice with the new hero that they will be switching to. The majority of people in your meta are not going to suddenly turn around and start playing Dash because someone in New Zealand won a deck with Dash, right? If you go to your weekly armory and everyone is always playing Prism and Prism, 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 then you can bet that when you show up to the Road to Nationals, 
those people are going to still be on prison. They're not going to suddenly have changed. They'll have practice. They'll have the stuff. That's what they've got. So just don't pivot too hard to thinking about these tier lists as the be all and end all of what you're going to expect to see at a road to nationals. It's just not the case. And that is quite highly reflected in this site. So this DefAb Dojo basically has tracked the um, the deck lists of people who have won Road to Nationals recently. So it's a great resource. Um, specifically, it has the New Zealand ones because I think the person making it knows all the store owners in New Zealand. But I imagine it will get others added to it when um, we might even get an update to the official one this evening, which would be great um because they usually update it on thursdays so that could be really good um but this is a great starting point if you are looking to say okay i play my hero this way um maybe i should therefore switch to play it a different way you can get some you know some suggestions and advice from looking at what other people have tried the important part to remember is that these decks are responsive to the meta uh the, the person building them has built around and, and played around which is why when you see lists like Bolton and you're like, I have no Boltons, you need to start understanding what cards are in this list to deal with the Bolton matchup that wouldn't go in if you had a lot of Prism in your environment. So, for example, Chain is not running any... Uh, well, he's running Command and Conquer, but he's not running any other six-cost attacks. Should you add some more if you have a lot of Prism in your environment? Personally, with Chain, I don't think you need to. But, you know, that's a good question for you to have. Um, if you're playing Bolton, you know, are you running Celestial Cataclysms and Bolting Blades? And are you running Command and Conquers? You know, can you just tread Prism with all of your seven strength attacks? You can. So is Bolton a good choice for Prism with that build? Great. So it's important to take the time to stop and think about that. Don't just copy these lists. Look at the meta that that person played in. What, what else was in the top cut? Because that's kind of an idea of what else... Um, you know, what else they would have gone up to in against in their formats um, and, and kind of come into it with that logic of um, my feel is not going to be necessarily the field that I saw online or that I saw at the last Road to Nationals. Um, even in the UK, the first one I went to on Saturday, Heavy Prism. London has a lot of players that started in Monarch. So we have Heavy Prism and Chain representation, a few outliers, some Viscerai, some, some Reinar, but you know, lots of those two. Um, and then when you go up to another tournament, so going to the one in Northampton, we had a lot of Dash coming out, a lot of Bravo, a lot of Viscerai, a lot of Arc and WTR heroes from people who started playing back then. And people more likely to play their favorite hero from those original sets than switch to something new. So I think that's just, that's kind of the main takeaway there. The other thing I want to talk about is just in terms of practice, obviously it is good to just pick the best deck you think you're going to face in your meta, chain, um, prism, bravo, you know, whatever you think you're going to be you're going to be coming up against a lot, and test your deck against it. It's important, and I know people have done this and, and come close to doing this, to not throw away your entire strategy of a winning deck to try and find a weird niche way of playing, like three or four days before an event. It's just not practical. Um, tweaks, changes to your deck to make it more responsive to the meta, sure. But keep that core intact, keep the main strategy intact. Because otherwise you're going to confuse yourself and your practice isn't going to be as effective as you thought it was. So for example, one of my local players said, I'm really having trouble with Chain as Prism, so I'm going to build a deck that's going to try and fatigue them. And I said, okay, great. But you're playing in a road to nationals on Saturday. What is your plan for getting the reps in against Chain to see, A, does your new strategy work? And B you know, can I get enough practice with it to make sure it works when I play it? So we just sat down and we played five games because we were lucky that he made that decision just before our weekly testing night. And we played five. We played, I think it was three games. And I won every single one with a chain deck. And I obviously am not maining chain at the moment. So, you know, there's an assumption that a better chain player than I am, because it's not my main deck, would have won as well. So that strategy didn't work, so we threw it out. It is good to test those things, but I said to him, you know, the tournament is also in three days. You need to solidify these things. You need to not change your deck so much. You need to go with a strategy you're very comfortable with and, you know, you know, and beat the other decks in the field as well and maybe race and maybe you can race chain and, and win some games with a certain bit of a lot. Because, I mean, how does Prism win versus chain? You get him low enough 
that he has to block. And then you make shields to absorb some of his damage and ping him with them and then try and get him down to one. And then once you get him down to one, you make more shields, which you then stab with like Kodachi's every turn. And he has to block each shield swing until eventually you've got so many shields he can't block. You know, that's one of the strategies Prism can do to beat Chain. But, you know, you kind of just have to go for it. So that's kind of advice for testing is tweaks rather than overhauls, unless it's really not working, in which case, obviously, you do what you've got to do to make the deck work. Uh, you might just copy a deck from someone else and just try and get that to work. Um, but, you know, changing like there's there's lots of stories of I changed my deck the night before the tournament and I did X. And it's like, well, if you've completely changed your deck, you know, it's going to be very hard to have the practice to actively win, um, <laughs> you know, to the level that you want to, because you won't have the the preparation for it. Um, so I think that's some good takeaways so far. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to talk to you about without getting into like decks and stuff like that. Um, so in other words, well, let's go back to this for one second. So what decks do I think you should genuinely, you know, the good decks are? I think Bravo is great. Obviously, you're going to play against Chain. Um, I feel like Dash is very good, um, especially, you know, if she can get that control into you. Um, Bolton is a weird, like, outlier because he can really absolutely shred some decks and he's, you know, he's really interesting in how, like, strong he is against someone like Prism or, you know, some of the more controly decks. And he can just go into them and, like, you know, he, he's got enough damage to just race and smash people. And it's really good to see. So Bolton is there, but I don't think we see as much of him. I'm not really that worried about Prism. Um, A lot of people are, but I think if you're playing an aggro hero like Chain... um. You don't really have to worry that much about Prism. Like Prism is Prism is popular, but Prism is kind of like a Swiss threat rather than a top cut nemesis outside like one or two metas. And I know Prism has one one. And obviously if your whole meta is full of Prism, then she's gonna be a problem at every level. But a lot of the other tournaments we're seeing, Prism isn't really the main threat. She's just there. And then she's getting knocked out in the top eight by other decks, you know, um, just because you know, you can outrace Prism. It feels weird, you know, when a deck can come at you with 17, you know, with like 5 and 5 or 5 and 7, 12 damage, blah, you know, Phantom of Clasm is etc. It feels weird to say you can outrace Prism, but for them to do that, they're not allowed to block at all because um, they need four card hands. Three card hands don't cut it, which means that they actually can't race as well as they think they can. And if they block at all, then they lose their two-card tempo, so they can't do two attacks. And if they don't block at all, then you get on hits, etc., etc., consuming volitions, Katsu's on hit effects, go off and really punish them for not defending. So you can get them down really, really low if they insist on hitting you really hard. And if they don't insist on hitting you really hard, then you can just keep breaking through and taking that five damage a turn until you get them low enough that they have to block even more and suddenly their plan starts to fall apart. So I'm not that I'm not really that afraid of Prism. And I'll say this, and then on Saturday I'll just get trashed by a Prism. Um, I think Dash is something good to be afraid of. I mean, you've got, you've got the Zipper Hits, you've got Command and Conquers, you've got a lot of scary attacks in Dash, alongside the whole I can play Plasma Purifiers and um, Induction Chambers if I want to, um, which is like a good threat to control. But I imagine that Dash players actually side those out if they're playing against aggro and just try and race with the 0 to 60s and the boosts. Um, so that's worth being aware of. I mean, I think there's a very good list in Dash that just takes out, um, you know, induction chambers, plasma purifiers, um, everything that isn't a, a mechanologist card or a, or a boost card or an attack action and just goes for the boost and the massive attack turns. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think that's kind of my thoughts for now. Obviously, I'm really excited for this weekend. I've done well in the first two that I've been to. Um, I'm really excited to see if I can repeat that performance. Um, I would really love to keep some sort of a winning streak or a winning record for the Road to Nationals. Um, I'm not saying I need to win more tunics or anything like that, but obviously, um, if I somehow luck my way into winning another tunic, I will, um, uh, you know, that will be good for paying me back for all of the... Uh, all of the road to national entry that I've had to pay. So uh, that's just an interesting option there. 
And that's kind of, I think, where I'm getting to on this. So, kind of sum up the points I've been talking about. It's okay to not be super perfectionist about people you're watching on a stream. Let the judge handle it. Let the people on the ground find a resolution they're happy with. Don't go crazy about it. Just, you know, accept the tournament's going to keep running. People are going to find a resolution. Mistakes happen on stream as much as they happen off the stream. Um, and most mistakes that happen in tournaments do not get reported to judges. Most mistakes that happen in tournaments get resolved between the two players. I forgot to take that blood debt damage. Okay, well, can you take two damage now? Okay, cool. Um, you know, oh, we didn't do this rune chant. Okay, well, let's do it now. Um, you didn't have the resources to pay for that. Okay, well, let me pitch this instead. Like, the majority of these mistakes are fixed without the judge even getting involved. Players just find a resolution, like they do in casual play, like they do when you're playing with friends. Um, every so often at a high level, obviously, the judge has to be called. People do disagree. You know, people do cheat. Mistakes go wrong. But as spectators, it is fine for you to just sit back, enjoy the game, enjoy the highs and the lows. Something goes wrong, let the people in front deal with it. Don't get worked up. Don't expect your road to nationals to be a one specific meta just because that's what the good people are playing in New Zealand or, oh, well, Chain has won loads of tournaments. Everyone is going to be playing Chain. The people in your road to national local area were not playing Chain beforehand. They're not suddenly going to have procured, you know, three Art of Wars and loads of husks and grasps and everything. You know, those cards are in short supply. Not everyone can just switch to the new meta. That's important to keep in mind. Now, you may have a massive influx of chain players from a neighboring meta that you weren't expecting, but not everyone travels. So, you know, talk to your friends in that meta if they think a lot of chains coming. That's good information to gather, but don't just assume that because they had 20 chain players turn up to their weekly event that all 20 are going to come. The more to be balanced. This isn't like a video game anymore. A lot of people will know this, but people who don't play card games as much will think people play the top tier heroes it really isn't like that. It's not like a video game. Not everyone has all the cards. I mean, look, in League of Legends, if you don't have all the heroes, you play the heroes you want. You don't play the top tier heroes, right? And even then, a lot of people will play the hero they like, or they like the look of, they like the aesthetic of, they like the play style of, they've got the most practice with, not necessarily the best meta hero. Okay? And third takeaway, when practicing, if you're almost at the event, try to avoid changing your entire strategy. Weeks is good. Look at these deck lists on sites like Fab Dojo for advice, but don't assume that everything they do suits the game that you're going to end up playing. Again, it kind of ties back to keeping an eye on who's playing what, how many of certain deck you expect to run into, keeping an eye on what you know your friends and the people you play with like to play, and trying to avoid copying any of the tech that doesn't really line up with, you know, the games that you're going to have to play at your event. So it's like if I go to a London event and I haven't respected Prism. I know because loads of people got in Monarch, they love how Prism looks, they like her playstyle, that I will play up against at least 10 Prism players. And I know three of them are very, very good and have the capabilities to get into the top cut and have won similar side tournaments before. So I have to respect Prism. You might not have to. You might have to deal with a load of Bravo. But it's important to understand the deck list you see online don't necessarily match up to what you're going to have. Anyway, we're at 38 minutes, so that's where I'm going to leave it. Um, there will be a deck tech for my deck next week. A lot of you will be familiar with the shell. It's Agro Katsu. But I have, obviously, via um, Tabletop24, recordings of my matches. I will be doing playthrough um, re responses, giving ideas for my logic, why I played certain ways, um, etc., etc. I think people will find that very interesting, as well as my sideboard lists and things like that. Once I get over this two weeks, weekends of just intense Road to Nationals gameplay, I will have more free time to put together a more elaborate video where I actually talk through the deck and what that means. And maybe you'll take it to a road to nationals if you play Katsu and, and give it a try. Um, and that's it, really. Um, other than that, I am I have two or three more flesh and blood pieces of content in the pipeline at the moment. Um, I have some just discussions about... Um, you know, like promos and prizes and stuff like that that I want to have a talk about because I think there's a lot of room for LSS to improve on that. Um, there's a bit of a discussion that I want to have about just game design. And I mean, if you've listened this far, you can tell me if you think this is interesting. But obviously there's this big idea in video games and Asmongold did a video on this earlier today. The idea of parasitic design, as in I add something to the game that takes away from other games. 
And there is actually a discussion I want to have about whether the talent system is a level of parasitic design where I'm adding things that aren't... Because the way Flesh and Blood is, I don't want to get into this too much now, is that if I add a new talent class, that talent class can't be played with a lot of the cards from another talent class. And I'm kind of expanding the old talent class out sideways, but it's kind of like throwing a bone and building a whole new fork. And you can kind of see it with classes like Wizard, which then get put into the game but then get no further support. So they kind of just feel like this outlying factor rather than actually being an active part of the game if they aren't staying balanced and relevant. Now, I know Katsu, for example, has stayed balanced and relevant, even though Wizard hasn't. But my point is more that, like, as the game grows, as we get more new classes, there'll be more of these outlier classes that didn't get support. And in some ways, it is kind of cool because they can get looped back in but on the other hand, they are kind of cannibalizing their own player base onto new heroes rather than, you know, supporting a specific small set. Whereas a game like Magic, for example, because it always has those five colors, right? And this is kind of a problem with factional gameplay is that if you have limited factions that come out, like in Netrunner, you might have um, the, the, the small factions or you have the individual IDs which take away from each other. Um, but if you have factional gameplay where the faction combinations split a lot, like we're having in Flesh and Blood here where it's Shadow Warrior and then we'll get, sorry, Light Warrior and then later on we'll get a Mech Warrior and those two don't interact. There is very much the sense that they are these silos of design that don't interact as well. And one of the reasons that Magic has stayed popular is that if you are, say, a red player in Magic, you can play red with red in every set until you don't want to play red anymore. But if you are a warrior player in Flesh and Blood, you don't necessarily get to play warrior in every set because, you know, we've got a good Bolton now, but if the next set comes out and it doesn't have warrior in, then we're not going to have a good Bolton. And then maybe it gets outraced by something else. And then where are we now? You can't play Bolton anymore, but you also can't play Dorinthia. You can't play warrior. So all of those cards you bought aren't useful anymore, which is a problem Flesh and Blood is going to have to deal with, this idea of parasitic design or eating, from, eating away at someone else. So... I'll do a video on that. I think that's very interesting. I'm going to do a deck tech and I'm going to do a video on price support promos. What could be done better? Um, and then I think that's kind of it for where I am on the content right now. Obviously, at this stage, I'm looking for Flesh and Blood Tales of Aria pre-orders. I've got my budget set aside for that. Um, I've got speculation video I suppose I need to do on that. Um, but I've kind of already done a bit of it, but we're going to get a Guardian. We're going to get a Ranger. And we're either going to get a Warden, a Nature Warden, or we're going to get a druid or a shapeshifter or a wizard. Something along those lines. But that's kind of where we're going with that. And then hopefully, at some point soon, I will get a preview for this set. I have applied for the content creator um, uh, list. I don't know if I've been added to it. I've never gotten an email back. Um, I am sometimes critical of LSS in my videos. So maybe they don't want to add me to it. But um, I would like to believe that my criticisms come from... A place of love and um i really enjoy the game as you can tell i really enjoy playing it so um you know uh i think it is fair to say that if i'm criticizing your game it's because i want it to do better rather than necessarily being critical of it for the sake of criticizing so i'm gonna leave you with that thank you all for listening as a final note if you did like this video obviously getting subscribers is how i know that people liked this video the majority of people who watch do not subscribe so please do just hit subscribe hit that bell You'll hear when my videos come out. I do not produce them every day. I do not do box openings and, you know, raffles and all those sort of things. You will only get these sort of in-depth thinking analysis pieces from me about certain aspects of the game, tournaments, metas, um, decks, things like that. You're not going to get that much fluff. So I'm not going to be spamming you with notifications. So you can hit that bell. You'll hear from me more often. And hopefully you like this video. Thank you very much.